Welcome to Sci-Fi Radio's reading of Episode 3 of The Roaring Trumpet, co-authored by L. Sprague de Camp and Fletcher Pratt. In Episode 1, we met our leading character, Harold Shea, a psychologist, and his colleagues at the Garrison Hospital. Dr. Chalmers, his boss, explained his ideas for a new science of paraphysics and his hope to develop a safe method of parallel world travel. Unbeknownst to the others, Harold Shade decides to try his boss's theory out. He applies the procedure, but accidentally arrives in the world of Norse mythology instead of his target. Lost and freezing. Shay falls in with Odin, who leads him to an inn at the crossroads of the world. In episode two, at the inn, Harold is befriended by a mortal man, Thialfi, through whose offices he comes under the dubious patronage of the malicious, mischief-making Loki. Thialfi tells Harold that he is witnessing a meeting of gods, not mortal men. Harold learns from Loki's rival, the authoritative but congenial Heimdall, of the current situation, telling Shay that the world is on the verge of the time, Ragnarok, the final conflict between the gods and the giants. It seems that the gods face dim prospects in the coming battle as two of their most potent magical weapons, Thor's hammer and Frey's sword, have been stolen by their enemies. Harold goes to bed, but unable to sleep, he employs his 20th century mind to analyze what Heimdall told him. However, not quite believing that he has been in the company of gods. Tonight we join Harold to witness his adaptation to the governing laws and to the powers of authority in a parallel world where he struggles, as before, with feeling out of place and insignificant. Our roaring trumpet cast is Harold Shea is played by Ray, while Shay's inner thoughts are read by Kay, Screamer the Giant, read by Bill, Thialfi by Dan, Thor the Redbeard by Tom, Loki, also known as Uncle Fox, by Sandy, Heimdall is Scott, and our narrator is Galen. And now Sci-Fi Radio brings you Episode 3 of The Roaring Trumpet Shay woke with a set of fur-bearing teeth and a headache that resembled the establishment of a drop-forging plant inside his brain. Whether from the mead or the effect of those two piercing glances he had received from Heimdall and Odin, he could not tell. It was severe enough to stir him to a morning-after resolution to avoid all three in the future. When the panel of his bedroom door slid back, he could hear voices from the hall. Thor, Loki, and Thialfi were at breakfast as he came in, tearing away with knives and fingers at the stakes the size of unabridged dictionaries. The foxy-faced Loki greeted him cheerfully. Hail, hero of the turnip fields. Will your lordship do us the honor of breakfasting with us? He shoved a wooden platter with a hunk of meat on it toward Shay and passed along one of a collection of filled mugs. Shay's mouth was dry, but he almost gagged when a pull at the mug showed it contained beer, and sour beer at that. <laughs> Ridiculous it is to see the children of men who have no fixed customs grow uneasy when customs about them change. Herald of the turnips, I am told you are a notable warlock. Shay looked at his plate. I know one or two tricks. 
It was only to be expected that a hero of such unusual powers would be modest. Now there is this to be said. A man fares ill at Ragnarok unless he have his place. Would you be one of my band at the time? Shea gulped. He was still unconvinced about this story of a battle and the end of the world, but he might as well ride with the current till he could master it. Yes, sir, and thank you. The worm consents to ride on the eagle's wings. Thank you, most gracious worm. Then I will tell you what you must do. You must go with us to Jotunheim, and that will be a hard journey. She remembered his conversation with Heimdall the night before. Isn't that where some of the giants live? The frost giants, to be exact. That lying, sleepless one claims to have heard Thor's hammer humming somewhere in their castle. And for all of us, it will be well to find that weapon. But we shall need whatever we possess of strength and magic in the task. Unless, Lord Turnipeter, you think you can recover it without our help. Shea gulped again. Should I go with them? I had come back looking for adventure. But enough was enough. What is adventure? I remembered reading somewhere with the answer, somebody else having a hell of a tough time a thousand miles away. Only... Thialfi had come round the table and said in a low voice, Look, my sister Roskva is staying here at the crossroads because the giant killer don't think Jotunheim would be any place for a woman. That leaves me all alone with these Esir and an awful lot of giants. I'd be mighty obliged if you could see your way to keep me company. I'll do it. Then I realized that my impulsiveness had let me in for something. If Loki and Thor were not sure they could recover the hammer without help, it was likely to be an enterprise of some difficulty. Still, neither Asir nor Giants knew about matches or the revolver. They would do for magic till something better came along. I've already spoken to the Lord of the Goat Chariot. He'd be glad to have you come, but he says you mustn't disgrace him by asking to eat turnips. You'd best do something about those clothes. They're more than light for this climate. Sver Bonder will lend you some others. Sver was glad to take the inadequate polo coat and riding breeches as security for the loan of some baggy Norse garments. Shea, newly dressed in accordance with his surroundings, went outside. A low, cheerless sun shone on the blinding white of new snow. As the biting cold nipped his nose, Shea was thankful for the yards of coarse wool in which he was swathed. The goat chariot was waiting. It was as big as a Conestoga wagon. A line of incised runic letters was etched in black around the gold rim, the body was boldly painted red and gold, but the goats constituted the most remarkable feature. One was black, the other white, and they were as big as horses. This here is Tooth Nasher. Thialfi indicated the nigh goat. And that there is Tooth Gritter. Waving at the off goat, the black one. Say, friend Harald, I'd be mighty obliged if he'd help me tote the stuff out. Ignorant of what the stuff was, I followed Thialfi into the bonder's house, where the latter pointed to a big oak chest. This, he explained, held the Asir's belongings. Thialfi hoisted one end by its bronze handle. I took hold of the other, expecting it to come up easily. The chest did not move. I looked at Thialfi, but the latter merely stood, holding his end off the floor without apparent effort. So I took my handle in both hands and gave a mighty heave. I got my end up, but the thing seemed packed with ingots of lead. We went through the door, Theophi leading, 
me staggering and straining along in the rear. I almost yelled to Theophy to hurry and ease the horrible strain on my arms. But this would involve so much loss of face that I stuck it out. When they reached the chariot, I dropped my end into the snow and almost collapsed across the chest. The icy air hurt my lungs as I drew great gasps of breath. All right, you catch hold here and we'll shove her aboard. I forced my unwilling body to obey. We manhandled one end of the chest onto the tail of the chariot and somehow got the whole thing aboard. I was uncomfortably aware that Theophy had done three quarters of the work, but the rustic seemed not to notice. With the load in, I leaned against one of the shafts, waiting for my heart to slow down and for the aches in my arms and chest to subside. Now it is to be seen that Theophy has persuaded another mortal to share his labors. Convenient is this for Theophy. It was the foxy-faced Loki with the usual note of mockery in his voice. Once more, my temper began to rise. Theophy was all right, but it did look as though he had talked to me into coming along for the dirty work. If, whoa, I suddenly remembered Loki's title, bringer of discord, and Theophy's warning about his jokes. Uncle Fox would doubtless think it was very funny to get the two mortals into a quarrel. And for the sake of my own credit, I didn't dare let the god succeed. Just then came a tug at his cloak. He whirled around. Tooth Gritter had seized the edge of his garment in his teeth and was trying to drag it off him. Hey! She dragged back. The giant goat shook its head and held on while Loki stood with hands on hips laughing in a deep, rich belly laugh. He made not the slightest move to help Shay. Theolfi came running round and added his strength to Shay's. The cloak came loose with its grip. The two mortals tumbled backward. Tooth Gritter calmly munched the fragment he had torn from the cloak and swallowed it. Shay got up scowling and faced a Loki purple with amusement. Say, you! What the hell so damn funny? At that instant, Theolfi seized him from behind and whirled him away as though he were a child. Shut up, you nitwit. He flung into Shay's ear. Don't you know he could burn you to a cinder just by looking at you? But... But nothing. Them's gods. No matter what they do, he doesn't say boo, or they'll do something worse. That's how things be. Okay. I reflected the rustics the world over were a little too ready to accept that's how things be. And that when the opportunity came, I would get back some of my own from Loki. You want to be careful around them goats. They're mean and they eat most anything. I remember a funny thing has happened a fortnight back. We found five men that had frozen to death on the moor. I says, we ought to take them in so their folks could give them burial. Thor says, all right, take them in. When we got to the house we was going to stay at, the bonder didn't see as how there was any point in bringing him inside, because when they got thawed out, they'd get kind of strong. So we stacked him in the yard like firewood. Next morning, would you believe it, these goats had gotten at him and ate him up, everything but their buckles. <laughs> As she was digesting this example of Norse humor, there came a shout. Come on, mortals! Thor had climbed into the chariot. He clucked to the goats who leaned forward. The chariot wheels screeched and turned. Hurry! Thialfi ran for the chariot. He had reached it and jumped aboard with a single huge bound before Shay even started. 
the latter ran behind the now rapidly moving vehicle and tried to hoist himself up. His fingers, again numbed with cold, slipped, and he went sprawling on his face in the snow. <laughs> As he pulled himself to his feet, he remembered bitterly that he had made this journey to escape the feeling of insignificance and maladjustment that his former life had given him. There was nothing to do but run after the chariot again. The Althe pulled him over the tail and slapped the snow from his clothes. Next time, he better get a good grip before you try to jump. You know what it says in Havamal, it is better to live than to lie a corpse. The quick man catches the cart. Thor, at the front of the chariot, said something to the goats. They broke from a trot to a gallop. Shay, clutching the sides of the vehicle, became aware that it had no springs. He found he could take the jolting best by flexing his legs and yielding to the jerks. Loki leaned toward him, grinning. Hey, Turnip Herald, let us be merry. I smiled uncertainly. Manner and voice were friendly, but might conceal some new malicious trick. Be merry while you can. These hill giants are uncertain of humor where we go. <laughs> I remember a warlock named Berger. He put a spell on one of the hill giants, so he married a goat instead of a girl. The giant cut Berger open, tied one end of his entrails to a tree, and chased him around it. <laughs> the anecdote was not appetizing, and the chariot was bounding on at the same furious pace, throwing us into the air every time it hit a bump. Up, down. Bang, up, down, bang. I began to regret my breakfast. You look poorly, friend Harald. Sort of goose green. Shall I get something to eat? I had been fighting my stomach in desperate dread of losing further prestige. But the word eat ended the battle. I leaned far over the side of the chariot. Loki laughed. Thor turned at the sound and drowned Loki's laughter in a roar of his own. Ha 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 ha! If you foul up my chariot, turn up, Harald, I'll make you clean it. There was a kind of good-natured contempt in the tone, more galling than Uncle Fox's amusement. Shay's stomach finally eased its convulsions, and he sat down on the chest, wishing he were dead. Perhaps it was the discomfort of the seat, but he soon stood up again, forcing himself to grin. I'll be all right now. I'm just not used to such a pace. Thor turned his head again. You think this fast, Springling? You have in no wise any experience of speed. Watch! He whistled to the goats, who stretched their heads forward and really opened out. The chariot seemed to spend most of the time in the air. At intervals, it would hit a ridge in the road with a thunderous bang and then take off again. Shay clung for dear life to the side, estimating their speed at something between 60 and 70 miles an hour. This is not much in a modern automobile on a concrete road, but something quite different in a two-wheeled springless cart on a rutted track. Wow, wow, wow! Thor was carried away by his own enjoyment. Hang on, here's a curve. Instead of slackening speed, the goats fairly leaped, banking inward on the turn. The chariot lurched in the opposite direction. Shay clung with his eyes closed and one arm over the side. Yoo-wee! It went on for ten minutes more before Thialfi suggested lunch. Shay found himself actually hungry again. But my appetite quailed at the sight of some flabs that looked like scorched leather. Oh, what's that? Smoked salmon. You put one end in your mouth like this. Then you bite. Then you swallow. You have sense enough to swallow, I suppose. I tried it. I was amazed that any fish could be so tough. 
But as I gnawed, I became more aware of a delicious flavor. When I get back, I thought, I must look up some of this stuff. Rather, if I get back. The temperature rose during the afternoon, and toward evening, the wheels were throwing out fans of slush. Whoa! The goats stopped. They were in a hollow between low hills, gray save where the snow had melted to show dark patches of grass. In the hollow itself, a few discouraged-looking spruces showed black in the twilight. Here we camp. Goat steak would be our feasting, had we but fire. What does he mean? It's one of the Thunderer's magic tricks. He slaughters tooth gnasher or tooth gritter, and we can eat all but the hide and bones. Then he magics them back to life. Loki was then saying to Thor, Uncertain is it, enemy of the worm, whether my fire spell will be effective here. In this hill giant land, there are spells against spells. Your lightning flash? It can shiver and slave, but not kindle in this damp. You have a new warlock there. Why not make him work? Shay had been feeling for his matches. They were there and dry. This was his chance. That'll be easy. I can make your fire as easy as snapping my fingers. Honest. Thor glared at him with suspicion. Few are the weaklings equal to any works. For my part, I always hold that strength and courage are the first requirements of a man. But... I will not gainsay that occasionally my brothers feel otherwise, and it may be that you can do as you say. There is also cleverness, wielder of Molnir. Even your hammer blows would be worthless if you did not know where to strike. And it may be that this outlander can show us some new thing. Now I propose a contest, we two and the warlock. The first of us to make the fire light shall have a blow at either of the others. Hey, if Thor takes a swat at me, you'll have to get a new warlock. That will not be difficult. Loki grinned and rubbed his hands together, though I decided the sly god would find something funny about his mother's funeral. For once, I was not caught. I grinned back and thought I detected a flicker of approval in Uncle Fox's eyes. Shay and Thialfi tramped through the slush to a clump of spruces. As he pulled out his supposedly rust-proof knife, Shay was dismayed to observe that the blade had developed a number of dull red freckles. He worked manfully, hacking down a number of trees and branches. They were piled on a spot from which the snow had disappeared though the ground was still sopping. Who's going to try first? Don't be more foolish than you have to. Redbeard, of course. Thor walked up to the pile of brush and extended his hands. There was a blue glow of corona discharge around them and a piercing crack as the bright electric sparks leaped from his fingers to the wood. The brush stirred a little, and a few puffs of water vapor rose from it. Thor frowned in concentration. Again the sparks crackled, but no fire resulted. Too damp is the wood. Now you shall make the attempt, sly one. Loki extended his hands and muttered something too low for Shay to hear. A rosy violet glow shone from his hands, and danced among the brush. In the twilight, the strange illumination lit up Loki's sandy red goatee, high cheekbones, and slanting brows with startling effect. His lips moved almost silently. The spruce steamed gently, but did not light. Loki stepped back. The magenta glow died out. A night's work. Let us see what our warlock can do. 
Shay had been assembling a few small twigs, rubbing them to dryness on his clothes and arranging them like an Indian teepee. They were still dampish, but he supposed spruce would contain enough resin to light. Now, let everybody watch. This is strong magic. He felt around in the little container that held his matches until he found some of the non-safety kitchen type. His three companions held their breaths as he took out a match and struck it against the box. Nothing happened. He tried again. Still no result. He threw the match away and essayed another, again without success. He tried another, and another, and another. He tried two at once. He put away the kitchen matches and got out a box of safety matches. The result was no better. There was no visible reason. The matches simply would not light. He stood up. I'm sorry, but something has gone wrong. If you'll just wait a minute, I'll look it up in my book of magic formulas. There was just enough light left to read by. Shea got out his Boy Scout manual. Surely it would tell him what to do. If not with failing matches, at least it would instruct him in the art of rubbing sticks. He opened it at random and peered, blinked his eyes, shook his head, and peered again. The light was good enough, but the black marks on the page, which presumably were printed sentences, were utterly meaningless. A few letters looked vaguely familiar, but he could make nothing of the words. He leafed rapidly through the book. It was the same senseless jumble of hen tracks everywhere. Even the few diagrams meant nothing without the text. Harold Shea stood with his mouth open, and not the faintest idea of what to do next. Well, where is our warlock fire? <laughs> he perhaps prefers to eat his turnips uncooked. I, I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid it won't work. Thor lifted his massive fist. It is time to put an end to this lying and feeble child of man who raises our hopes and then condemns us to a dinner of cold salmon. No, Slayer of Giants, hold your hand. He furnishes us something to laugh at, which is always good in this melancholy country. I may be able to use him where we are going. Thor slowly lowered his arm. Mm. Yours be the responsibility. I am not unfriendly to the children of men, but for liars I have no sympathy. What I say I can do, and that will I do. If you please, sir, there's a dark something up yonder. He pointed toward the head of the valley. Maybe we can find shelter. Thor growled an assent. They got back into the chariot and drove up toward the dark mass. Shea was silent with the blackest of thoughts. He would leave his position as researcher at the Garrett Institute to go after adventure with a capital A, would he? And as an escape from a position where he felt himself inferior and enclosed, well, he told himself bitterly. He had landed in another, still more enclosed and inferior. Yet why was it his preparations had so utterly failed? There was no reason for the matches not lighting, or the books turning into gibberish, or for that matter, the failure of the flashlight on the night before. Thialfi was whispering to him. By the beard of Odin, I'm ashamed of you, friend. Why did he promise a fire if he couldn't make it? I thought I could. Honest. Well, maybe so. He certainly rubbed the thunderer the wrong way. You'd best be grateful to Uncle Fox. He saved your life for you. He ain't as bad as some people think, I always say. Usually helps you out in a real pinch. The dark something grew into the form of an oddly shaped house. The top was rounded, the near end completely open. When they went in, Shea found to his surprise that the floor was some linoleum-like material, 
as were the curving walls and low arched roof. There seemed only a single broad low room without furniture or lights. At the far end they could dimly make out five hallways, circular in cross-section, leading they knew not where. Nobody cared to explore. Theolfi and Shay dragged down the heavy chest and fished out blankets. For supper, the four glumly chewed pieces of smoked salmon. Thor's eyebrows worked in a manner that showed he was trying to control justifiable anger. It is in my mind that our fireless warlock has not heard the story of your fishing, son of Yord. Oh, that story is not unknown, but it is good that men should hear it and learn from it. Hmm, let me think. Odin preserve us. Fjallfi murmured in Shay's ear. I've only heard this a million times. I was guesting with the giant Ymir. We rowed far out in the blue sea. I baited my hook with a whole ox head, for the fish I fish are worthy a man's strength. At the first strike, I knew I had the greatest fish of all, to wit, the Midgard serpent, for his strength was so great. Three whales could not have pulled so hard. For nine hours I played the serpent, thrashing to and fro, before I pulled him in. When his head came over the gunwale, he sprayed venom in futile wrath. It ate holes in my clothes. His eyes were as great as shields, and his teeth that long. Thor held up his hands in the gloom to show the length of the teeth. I pulled, and the serpent pulled again. I was braced with my belt of strength. My feet nearly went through the bottom of the boat. I had all but landed the monster when I speak no untruth. That fool Hemir got scared and cut the line. The biggest thing any fisherman ever caught, and it escaped. I gave Hemir a thumping he will not soon forget, but it did not give me the trophy I wanted to hang on the walls of Thrudvang. Thialfi leaned towards Shay, singing in his ear. A man shall not boast of the fish that fled or the bear he failed to flay. Bigger they be than those born back to hang their heads in the hall. At least that's what Otley Draper says. Loki chuckled. He had caught the words. True, youngling. Had any but our friend and great protector told such a tale, I would doubt it. Mm, doubt me? I would... You, how would you like one of my buffets? He drew back his arm. Loki ducked. Thor uttered a huge, good-natured laugh. Ha 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 ha! Two things gods and mortals alike doubt. Tales of fishing and the virtue of women. He lay back among the blankets, took two deep breaths, and seemed to be snoring instantly. Loki and Thialfi also lapsed into silence. Unable to sleep, I let my mind go over the day's doings. I had shown up pretty badly. It annoyed me, for I was beginning to like these people, even the unapproachable and the tempestuous Thor. The big fellow was all right, someone you could depend on right up to the hilt, especially in any crisis that required straightforward courage. He would see right and wrong divided by a line of absolute sharpness. Chalk on one side, coal dust on the other. He became annoyed when others proved to lack his own simple strength. About Loki, I was not quite so sure. Uncle Fox had saved my life all right, but I suspected that there had been a touch of self-interest about the act. Loki expected to make some use of me, and not entirely as a butt of jokes, either. 
That keen mind had doubtless noted the unfamiliar gear I had brought from the 20th century and was speculating on its use. But why had those gadgets failed to work? Why had I been unable to read simple English print? Was it English? I tried to visualize my name in written form. It was easy enough and showed me that the transference had not made me illiterate. But wait a minute, what was I visualizing? I concentrated on the row of letters in my mind's eye. What I saw was these letters spelled Harold Brian Shea to me. At the same time, I realized they weren't the letters of the Latin alphabet. I tried some more visualizations. Man came out as something was wrong. Man, I vaguely remembered, ought not to have had four letters. Then gradually, I realized what had happened. Chalmers had been right and more than right. My mind had been filled with the fundamental assumptions of this new world. When I transferred from my safe Midwestern Institute to this howling wilderness, I had automatically changed languages. If it were otherwise, if the shift were partial, I would be a dement, insane. But the shift was complete. I was speaking and understanding Old Norse, touching Old Norse gods, and eating Old Norse food. No wonder I had had no difficulty making myself understood. But as an inevitable corollary, my knowledge of English had vanished. When I thought of the written form of man, I could form no concept but that of the four runic characters. I couldn't even imagine what the word would look like with the runes put into other characters, and I had failed to read my Boy Scout handbook. Naturally, my gadgets had failed to work. I was in a world not governed by the laws of 20th century physics or chemistry. It had a mental pattern which left no room for matches or flashlights or a non-rusting steel. These things were simply inconceivable to anyone around me. Therefore, they did not exist save as curiously shaped objects of no value. Well, anyway, at least I won't have to worry about the figure I cut in front of these guys again. I've fallen so low that nothing I could do would make me a bigger fool. Oh, what the hell. Shea awoke before dawn, shivering. The temperature was still above freezing when a wind had come up and the gray landscape was curtained with driving rain. He yawned and sat up with his blanket round him like an Indian. The others were still asleep and he stared out for a moment, trying to recover the thread of last night's thoughts. This world I was in, perhaps permanently, was governed by laws of its own. What were those laws? There was one piece of equipment of which the transference had not robbed me, my modern mind. Habituated to studying and analyzing the general rules guiding individual events. I ought to be able to reason out the rules governing this existence and to use them. Something which the rustic Theophy would never think of doing. So far, the only rules I had noticed were that the gods had unusual powers. But there must be general laws underlying even these. Thor's snores died away into a rasping rattle. 
The red beard god rubbed his eyes, sat up, and spat. Up, all the seers men. Ah, herald of the turnips, you are already awake. Cold salmon will be our breakfast again, since your fire magic failed. Then as he saw Shea stiffen. Nay, take it not unkindly. We, a seer, are not unkind to mortals, and I've seen more unpromising objects than you turn out all right. Make a man of you yet, youngling. Just watch me and imitate what I do. <sighs> and the yawn spread into a bristling grin. The others bestirred themselves. Thialfi got out some smoked salmon. However good the stuff was, Shea found the third successive meal of it a little too much. They were just beginning to gnaw when there was a heavy tramp outside. Through the rain loomed a gray shape whose outline made Shea's scalp tingle. It was mannish, but at least ten feet tall and massive columnar legs. It was a giant. The giant stooped and looked into the traveler's refuge. Shea, his heart beating madly, backed up against the curving wall, his hand feeling for his hunting knife. The face that looked in was huge, with bloodshot gray eyes and a scraggly iron-gray beard, and its expression was not encouraging. Oh, snarled the giant, showing yellow snags of teeth. His voice was a couple of octaves below the lowest human bass. Excuse me, gents, but I've been looking for my glove. How about having a little breakfast together, huh? Shay, Thialfi, and Loki all looked at Thor. The red god stood with his feet wide apart, surveying the giant for some minutes. Good is guesting on a journey. We offer some smoked salmon. But what have you? The name's Scream Bear, buddy. I got some bread and dried dragon meat. Say, ain't you Thor Odin's son, the hammer thrower? That is not incorrect. Boy, oh boy, ain't that something. The giant made a horrible face that was probably intended for a friendly grin. He reached around for a bag that hung at his back and sitting down in front of the shelter, opened it. Shea got a better view of him, though not one that inspired a more favorable impression. The monster's long gray hair was done up in a top knot with bone skewers stuck through it. He was dressed entirely in furs, of which the dark cloak must have come from the grandfather of all bears, though it was none too large for him. Scrymere took from his bag a slab of Norse bread the size of a mattress and several hunks of leathery gray meat. These he slapped down in front of the travelers. All right, you guys, help yourselves. Let's see some of that salmon, huh? Thialfi mutely handed over a piece of the salmon on which the giant set noisily to work. He drooled, now and then wiping his face with the back of his huge paw and getting himself well smeared with salmon grease. I found I had to break up my portion of the bread with my knife handle before I could manage it. So hard was the material. The dragon meat was a little easier, but still required some hard chewing. And my jaw muscles were sore from the beating they had taken in the last 24 hours. The dragon meat had a pungent, garlicky flavor that I didn't care for. As I gnawed, I saw a louse the size of a cockroach crawl out from the upper edge of one of Screamer's black fur leggings, amble around a bit, 
in the jungle of hair below the giant's knee and stroll back into its sanctuary. I almost gagged. My appetite tapered off, though presently it returned. After what I had been through lately, it would take more than a single louse to spoil, spoil my interest in food for any length of time. What the hell? Loki grinned slyly. Are there turnips in your bag, hairy one? Screamer frowned. Turnips? No. What you want with them? Our warlock, Loki jerked his thumb at Shay, eats them. What? No kidding. I heard of guys that eat bugs and drink cow's milk. But I ain't never heard of nobody what eats turnips. I said with a somewhat sickly smile. That's how I get some of my magic powers. I felt I had come out of it fairly well. Screamer belched. It was not an ordinary run of the mind belch, but something akin to a natural cataclysm. Shay tried to hold his breath until the air cleared. The giant settled himself. Hey, how come you is traveling to Jotunheim? Loki observed loftily, but with a side glance. The wing Thor travels where he will. All right, all right, but you don't have to get snotty about it. I was just thinking there's some relations of Harumnir and Jirod that was laying for Thor. They just love to have a chance to get even with you for bumping off those giants. Few will be more pleased than I to meet. Thank you for the warning, friend Screamer. Good is the guesting when men are friendly. We will do as much for you one of these days. Will you have more salmon? No, I had all I want. Would it be impertinent to ask whether, whither your giant ship is bound? Oh, I'm going up to Utgard. Utgard the Lokis is throwing a big feed for all the giants. Great and glorious will be that feasting. You're damn right it will be great. All the hill giants and frost giants and fire giants together at once. Say, that's something. It would give us pleasure to see it. If we went as guests of so formidable a giant as yourself, None of Hrungnir's or Gurod's friends would dare make trouble, would they? Screamer showed his snags in a pleased grin. Them punks? Ha! They wouldn't do nothing. He picked his teeth thoughtfully with thumb and forefinger. Yeah, I guess you can come. The big boss, Udgar Naloki, is a good guy and a friend of mine, so you won't have no trouble. If you'll clear out of my glove, we can start right now. What? 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 Yeah, my glove. That's what you slept in. The implications of this statement were so alarming that the four travelers picked up their belongings and scrambled out of the shelter with ludicrous haste, the mighty Thor included. End of episode three.